This is the Monday, June 24th, 2024 uh, meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And as we can all see, this is being done by remote participation. Um, and it is being recorded as we all saw too. So um, we have a number of items on the agenda tonight, a couple of um, a hearing and also a determination of significance for historic property. I just wanted to give a brief um, chair's report, but I also would like to um, open this up for public comment. If there's anyone in the um, audience that uh, has anything they would like to bring up that is not an item on the agenda, we'd be happy, more than happy to um, hear that now. And please just uh, raise your hand if you are one of those individuals. And I don't see any raising of hands, so I'm just going to go on. Um, a very brief chair's, chair's report. Um, one is that I wanted to just remind everybody that the planning board is meeting on Thursday night um, this week, the 27th at 7. Um, in the council chambers, which is the building behind City Hall, uh, to review the uh, recommendations of the preservation, uh, historic preservation element of the comprehensive plan. And this has been a long time in, the co in coming and a long process to complete this document. So I'd encourage everyone to attend if they can. I believe there is a virtual option. If you um, go on the planning board website, you can get the agenda and it will give you a link to um, joining that way. Um, but all those who can be live, that would be great as well to just have our, um, our representation and possibly have to answer some questions. Maybe not. Hopefully Judy Barrett, who is in charge of the, um, Judy Barrett, uh, who is in charge of the project, uh, will be able to answer most. So um, I'm just getting a note from Janet Gross, who... Um, has something she would like to read. So this is going back to the public comment. I'm happy to do that now. Let me just finish the chair's report, Janet. Um, the second item, um, I believe Steve Strymer is going to be here tonight and I don't see him yet. Um, as everyone knows, he uh, is with the Ruggles Center and also has been spearheading the um, National Register nomination for the African Americans Abolition Reform District that is being proposed for Florence. Um, we received recent correspondence from MHC with a um, request to shrink the boundaries of the district. And I know Steve is concerned about it and was looking for some guidance. So hopefully Steve will be here and he can uh, present that information to us. Um, I just wanted to again thank Steve, who uh, is attending for his last meeting, and um, I wanted to thank you for your three years of excellent participation, and we're all very sorry to see you go. We'll, you'll be missed so much, um, so if you have any parting words you'd like to share with us at this time, you're welcome to. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that, <laughs> nor did I have a speech ready, but um, I would just like to say thank you. I, I learned a lot um, over the last three years, and um, it's been a really interesting um, time to learn more about how the city works, about what the commission does, about the planning process, the plan that we all worked on together, um, all kinds of things. So uh, I enjoyed uh, getting to meet and getting to know all of you and um, working on a lot of those things together. So Hopefully I'll see you again in um, other fora in the future. I didn't have a good year off too. I know you're looking forward to that. So. Yes, I do. I do have a sabbatical from my job. So I will be trying to write over the next 12 months. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, good luck with that. Thank you. Um, okay, and I think that concludes my chair report. The rest of the items um, are things that we're gonna be discussing. So I don't need to go into that. Uh, Janet, um, I'm getting chat from you saying you, do you see this, Sarah? Janet, um, she sounds like she's having a problem with her mic. Yeah, that there's nothing. If someone can't unmute, I'm not able to unmute anyone. Okay. Janet, um, 
if you uh, want to keep working on your problem on your end, we'd be happy to hear this at the end of the meeting. Um, so please, we encourage you to continue <laughs> working on that because we would it, like to hear your statement. Dan, it, sa it says you're unmuted. <laughs> Um, you are unmuted, but your uh, your your audio is kind of scrambled. Mm -hmm. You sound like you're kind of in a fish tank. Okay, keep working on it. We'll keep going, moving on. Does everyone like I am? Janet, mm -hmm. you sound like the teacher in the Peanuts cartoons. Oh yes, <laughs> that's even more accurate. Not the fish. Yeah. Um, well, what either keep working on it, Janet, or um, you're welcome to submit your statement and, and circulate it. We can have it circulated to all the commissioners. Or we could wait till the next meeting. Either one works. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item is approval of minutes, and we do not have any minutes tonight. So we will move uh, right on to the public hearing, which is a request for a local historic district certificate of appropriateness pursuant to section 195 of the Northampton code for installation of a 12 by 20 foot pergola and related landscaping work. And the applicant is Thomas Powell. The location is 345 Elm Street, parcel 24C-46. And what I wanted to just remind everyone is um, we're going to be looking in this application uh, at uh, the pergola and a retaining wall. There are other items that are part of the project, the exterior project, but those are those items are exempt from the ordinance, so they will not be something that we review. Um, and I think what I'll do is ask the applicant to talk, speak to us first, and then I can read um, out of the design standards, uh, the review criteria that we'll be using to evaluate. And again, just so everybody knows, um, this is a um, certificate of appropriateness application. So the idea here is uh, to approve um, based on the information we're being, or disapprove based on the information we're being presented. So do we have um, Mr. Powell here? Uh, yeah, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, can you, okay. Can, can you see us? Or I can't, I have, I tried to get this to work on my computer and on my tablet and we're just on the phone now. Can you see us? Yes. We can see you. And okay. if you don't okay. have the capability of projecting the, the application materials, I think Sarah can do that. Yeah, Sarah? sure. Okay. So we always like to look at visuals when we're making these um, assessments, even though everyone has seen them and I'm sure most of us have been by your property to take a look at what you're proposing. So, hmm. but, but the visuals will help. But if you'd like to give us an introduction while Sarah's getting those up, that would be great. Okay. So um, we have, our backyard is, um, because we're on a corner lot, um, and it's a very small lot. Um, we want to do something to uh, to improve the ambience in the in the backyard. One of the right now, when we bought the house a few years ago, there is a railroad tie retaining wall um, that was put in when the garage was originally built. Um, but either it was not very well done, and it, uh, it's it's kind of falling apart. All of the miscellaneous railroad ties are moving around. Um, it's blocking the garage door. So, so we want to do something a little bit better. We want to do it with um, Goshen stone and we want to do it instead of having one 30 inch high wall, we want to do it with two, two foot high walls uh, separated by about three feet and put um, some plant, uh, some plantings uh, in between. Um, so right now there's, uh, there's bushes that just run along the, uh, various, various shrubs that run just along the top of that, that wall. We want to have them between two smaller walls, um, and widen the staircase and make that Goshen stone as well. Um, and the, uh, and then down along the bottom, along to the side door of the garage, um, put, put stone walkway there as well. 
then there would be a stone walkway up to the back door from the from the staircase that comes up from the driveway um, and a branch going off to a patio that would be to the left in this picture that we're looking at right now um, along along the back of of the uh, south uh, east side of the house um, and on that uh, on that patio would be where the pergola would be um, and on the and the back corner of that uh, the back side of that we would uh, put a hot tub there. So in that picture right there, back back at that back corner of the house is um, coming coming forward in this picture from there would be where the patio and the pergola would be with the hot tub toward the back of that. Um, and then and then we would uh, there's some miscellaneous regrading to do so that we don't get water in the basement because right where those bushes are on the right side of that picture, we, we've got a little bit of a low spot and we get a little bit of water in the basement. Um, so then this this is the um, the plan that I that I laid out for approximately where everything would be located, showing what's originally what, what's currently there and and what changes we want to make to it. Um, and then also in there, uh, we wanted to rebuild the um, the rear stairs and the, and um, um, it's not really a porch, uh, but the the back the back entry to the house. <laughs> it's all kind of falling apart all the bricks all the bricks are coming apart and the railing has gotten loose so we want to redo that uh, with brick but with um, bluestone uh, caps on it uh, because right now the brick makes it very hard to shovel and it's on the shaded side of the house in the winter and it just gets icy back there it's always it's it's, it's, it's very treacherous <clears throat> so after a good storm we end up using the front door and walking around um mm -hmm. So um, and it, so it's not. I guess it's not pertinent to the application. But yeah, we also wanted to replace the the fence that's there because um, that's kind of falling apart too. Um, we oh so retain the and the retaining wall. Um, we wanted to do the two level thing that was along the side of the garage and then along the side of the driveway. Uh, then convert it to a one level, about two foot high wall, and have that go along the sidewalk along Woodlawn Avenue. And put the fence just behind that. Mm -hmm. Would the fence rem height remain the same? Say that again. Would the fence height remain the same? Uh, yeah. So it would be a, a smaller, a shorter structure because it would be sitting on top of a wall or behind a wall. Uh, it really, it really. Uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be about the same. Right now, it's a, a I, right now it's a six foot high wall. Six six foot high wall. Yeah, uh, we, we're it's not really um, it's not really going to change the height of the base of the fence. Even it's it's just going to make it because right now there's um, there's quite a, there's a slope up to where the fence is, so it'll just be okay. squaring squaring that off. It's just making it look even. Yeah. Um, Sarah, could you um, pull up the image of the plan? And is it possible for you to rotate that other direction? <clears throat> Can you rotate that? It's a PDF file. Okay, great. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, so there you can see the two levels of the retaining wall running along uh, horizontally in the middle of the picture and then they join together and, and there'd just be one uh, one wall going back and then i also wanted to square off the fence there so um i th think uh, yeah the wall the, i don't think the, the wall doesn't uh, go along the, the bottom of the fence where it joins the house it, it doesn't need to do that but it what that'll do is is that'll um, help level make a little little bit more level um area in the in the lawn Okay. Um, I'm just going to read the um, the design standards um, for, we would call this pergola an outbuilding. I guess it's a freestanding outbuilding um, or open air, I should say, with no walls. <clears throat> so what it says is newly constructed outbuildings should be compatible with the primary structure and scale and proportions 
and be made of the same or complementary materials, size, scale, and placement of outbuildings themselves, as well as the relation to the lot size and other structures on the lot and adjacent and nearby lots will be considered. Okay. Do commissioners have questions for um, the applicant? I, I have a question. Um, uh, uh, thank you for your submission, first of all. And I want to I want to say what a what a gorgeous house that is. I, it's really a it's a neat house. It's a neat property. And I don't know whether I'm allowed to say that as a commissioner, but I'm new, so I get to say that. <laughs> um, I I had a question about the pergola. Uh, is it says a six a six foot six inch post on top of footings? Is that right? Uh, it's a six six inch posts on top of a footing that is a uh, uh, sixteen inch diameter and forty eight feet uh, forty feet forty eight inches deep. So yeah, the the pergola manufacturer requires that that for a foundation. Okay, and then the posts so, are six inches square. Uh -huh. And yeah, I forgot how tall they are. Um, how tall they are? That's that was my question. Is how oh. how how tall is the structure? Okay. Papers are falling off the desk. That's up here's the. I got the. I got the design document, and I almost uh, the from the from the uh, manufacturer, and I was going to put it in the application, except that this got all kinds of warnings about not reproducing. It. Yeah. Uh, from the ground up to the up to the bottom surface of the of the upper deck there is uh seven feet one and a quarter inches okay so so probably about eight and a half feet overall Good. so the overall is eight feet four and three quarter inches ah okay good all right excellent all right so it would be shorter than the second level um windows uh -huh. just yeah, yeah. A picture of it. yeah the the second level windows on it would be just below the second level window the second floor windows is that what you're it, saying it'd be it'd it be, be it'd be several feet below right. below that right uh -huh. um, probably, the, uh, probably about the height of the the back um the back porch area there on the house is that right no i i think i think it'll be lower than that because the uh the first floor is a couple feet above ground level and then we have nine foot ceilings so it, it'll be it'll it'll be uh just below just above the first floor windows i think okay good thank you okay yep the thing is high is the uh, Greg, do you have any questions for Steve? We missed that. What? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I asked the other commissioners that they had questions. Oh. oh. Uh, I have no questions. To be honest, I delivered newspapers there uh, when I was a kid almost 50 years ago. So I completely understand what they're looking at doing. Um, I have no questions. Okay. Steve, anything? Um, I guess my only question would be, what are the materials of the pergola? Wood. Uh, it's um, pressure treated wood with uh, mahogany stain. Very okay. pretty. Thank you. We got a picture of the. They've got it in the. They they were cruising through it. Like that? Do they have a picture like that? Yeah, well, not quite like that. So this, this, wanna, this is this the. Uh, be pretty. If if you can see that, that's the the design of the upper part of the pergola. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And Steve, anything else? No, I think that was it. Okay. Um. So I have a couple questions. So the, you're using Goshen stone for the walls and the pathways. And is that also going to be the platform for the hot tub? Or are you pouring yes. like a slab yes. or? Okay. Yes. And they're going to um, plant some grass for us uh, around the patio. Oh. 
Well, okay. But the patio will be Goshen stone as well. Yes. And is it, uh, I'm assuming that's dry laid. Is it a dry laid stone? And uh, how are they, are they going to just, oh, what are you about the construction of the pergola? Is it going to be set on sauna tubes or how, how are they going to anchor that? Yeah, the, the pergola is set on, on uh, six, 16 inch by 48 inch deep sauna tubes um, okay. that, uh, that come up to just below the stone. So, so then the stone comes up uh, to, to the post from there. Okay. Um, and then the fence that you're planning to replace that with, will that also be the same material or are you planning on replacing it with cedar or? We were think we were talking about replacing it with cedar. Okay. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the things that's happening now with the fence on that property is that they, there is that big gate, right? Where you drive in, that you drive yeah. in. Right. Yes. And a lot of times it's closed, I've noticed. Um, so, so when it's closed, especially if you're walking and I think driving too, it, it's pretty hard to see into the back of your property from the street. Right. Yeah. Um, do you plan to replace those gates? Or are you going to just leave it open? Um, I was going to replace those gates with the same kind of design. Um, uh -huh. uh, we have a, we have a rather large German Shepherd, and he would be yeah. he, he would be uh, annoying people walking by if yeah. if uh, if we put a more open construction back there. Yeah, so I keep it closed all the time. Oh, okay. I've never seen him. <laughs> that's, that's why. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Although he's often laying on the couch in the front windows and and uh, barking at people that walk by with their dog with their dogs. So. so yeah, you can't really see the backyard through that gate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, I mean, if when you if you if you're like, yeah. So if you're walking by on the street, the fence kind of blocks the view of the house. If you're across the street in the park, you kind of look over it because the because the house is um, quite a bit higher than the base of the fence. Yeah. Really uh, see. Um, mm -hmm. There's no sidewalk on that side of woodlawn on the park there, so most of the people are not walking along that edge so much. That's and then right. Right. Okay. Um, okay. I think that answers my questions. Um, it sounds like you've given a lot of thought to this. And of course, we always appreciate that with um, the structures in the district. And you are the northern anchor. So you have a big responsibility there. <laughs> um, so that's great um, that you're investing. It looks like you're going to make some really nice improvements. So, okay. Um, the defense, and is, gonna the defense yeah. is going to look a lot better. And the stone is going yeah. to look a lot better than the railroad ties that are there now. Yeah, and uh, and it, it gives us a it gives us a good um, setting to put all kinds of nice uh, shrubbery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we can't weigh in on fences, but um, it is a little kind of formidable to have that wall. And now I know don't know if you thought at all about the design of the fence, but you may want to think about doing something that has a little more punctuation to it. Is it it doesn't a little feel like it, uh, it uh, has perforations of some kind. Um you know maybe isn't just a solid stockade. That's all I'm saying. But perforation. It, it, well you know like sometimes they have like the crisscross lattice at the top of the fence. Oh yeah yeah um um, or, or if we did, or if we did something that was um, like a shadow, so, solid for four feet, and then and then more like open a, at the you, top or something. What'd you say? Like a what? Well, there's shadow fencing where you have vertical, you have uh, vertical boards, and they're kind of um, offset from one another. Just something that gives it a little more uh, texture because it it is pretty, and it's been like that for years. I think you bought the house with that fence there, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been like that for years, and it's just. And, you know, I under certainly understand the need for privacy, but it's just something to think about. And we can't weigh in on that. So. OK, can... that's good to know. That's All right. Well, so that, that was one of the things we were thinking of doing is that, well, the landscaper was talking about uh, doing a custom built fence, but um, he hasn't given us any propo any proposals for, for what he might do. And we're also thinking about going to some some fencing places and 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 exploring what's available. Um, we're not going to. We're not planning on changing the fence that goes along um, between us and the next door neighbor at uh, three at three thirty seven uh, 
337 um that that fence is in is in decent shape and then the, the fence that's between our woodlawn neighbor that that fence is in is in good shape but the one that's along woodlawn is uh kind of um waving each direction <laughs> each direction yeah, and i've you know, and i've strapped it together a couple of times yeah i would imagine just the snow plows and it takes a beating out there because of the traffic yeah. And yeah okay unless anybody else has another oh dylan i'm you're here i'm sorry i totally bypassed you that's okay do you my have name, any questions my, or comments my name you probably Julie. know all of, i know well, we know who you are for god's sake um, I, you, um, you may have some thoughts about, you know, the history of this house and you grew up right near it. So I grew up right near it. I don't know a lot about the history of this house other than that. I've admired it, um, for my whole life coming down, coming up down the street. Um, I think the plan seems really well considered. Uh, the pergola seems, um, somewhat appropriate for the architectural style. So, um, I'm, I'm excited for it. Okay. All right. So if there aren't any other questions or comments, um, I, I would entertain a motion on this. And this would be to issue a certificate of appropriateness for the work that's being proposed at 345 Elm. I will make that motion. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And sir, do you need more language than that? No, nope, that is fine. Okay, great. Then we should take a vote. Unless okay. there's any more discussion. No. Okay. Take a vote. So uh roll call vote. Dylan? Yes. Steve? Yes. Michael? Yes. Greg? Yes. And Martha? Yes. All right, unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be looking forward to seeing the uh, trucks there uh aloning the stone. <laughs> yeah, I'm here a lot of, I live right near you. You live just a few houses down on Elm. Um, oh. so, uh, I'll be listening to the, you know, the chisels out there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Well, yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, situation with um, the trucks getting in here because there's yeah. no parking on our side of the street and, right. and we have a very tight driveway. Yeah. They'll figure uh, it out. Yeah. <laughs> They're gonna. They're gonna. Uh, the the landscaper said he'd he'd start over by the patio and work his way back, <laughs> moving his trucks out of the way as he goes. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Okay. Because once, because yeah, once the retaining wall is there, then there's no way to get a truck back there. Yeah. Can you use your garage, or is it full of stuff? Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> it's got stuff. It, it's Be honest. it's got it's it's got two motorcycles and a trailer uh, in there. Um, and I'll move. I move. Sometimes I leave a car out, and sometimes I pack it, pack all of the other stuff on one side so I can put one car in. But we'll yeah, shuffle things around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good luck. We'll be looking okay. forward to seeing the results. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So the next one is the. I, I guess um, we're, done. we're all set. So so we'll 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 uh, hang up now. Yes, unless Sarah, okay. do you any more? Yeah, okay, we're all set. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, great. So the next item on the agenda is a determination. Um, cert excuse me, determination of significance pursuant to the demolition ordinance. This is for 546 Audubon Road. It's map ID 4-2. Um, and we are um, at this juncture just uh, reviewing this application to determine whether it is historically significant. And if we believe it is historically significant, then we would need to uh, schedule a hearing to determine whether it's preferably preserved and that would take place at another meeting but tonight we are just trying to decide uh, whether we believe this building is significant and you know first few further attempts should be made to hold on to it um as sarah said uh in her staff report there is no inventory form for this property uh the uh, assessor's card and photos have been provided. I didn't see a date on the assessor's information. I think, Sarah, you told me it was like 1960. Uh, I, I'll pull it out. I, it was in the 40s sometime. I okay, believe. it's interesting because um, it's got a concrete block foundation. You yeah, see. yeah. Um, and I would just add that this is the step that's typically done by the subcommittee. 
Um, and that's in the interest of time. The commission only has 14 days to make this determination. The timing very rarely works out so that this can be done at a full commission meeting, but this one did. Okay, great. Um, all of you probably remember this, but I will just go through um, the criteria that we use to decide whether we believe this should be uh, or is significant. So the first is if the building or structure is listed on or is within an area listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Second, uh, the building or structure has been found eligible by the National Park Service or the Massachusetts Historical Commission for the National Register or the State Register or has an application pending. The building or structure is importantly associated with one or more historic persons or events or with the broad architectural, cultural, political, economic, or social history of the city or the Commonwealth, or the building or structure is historically or architecturally important in terms of period, style, method of building construction or association with a recognized architect or builder, either by itself or in the context of a group of buildings. And Sarah, can you just pull up the... Um, images of this sure. um, and I just looked at the second page of the assessor's card it was built in 1940 but it has an effective year built of 1970 so the foundation may have been redone that's interesting yeah okay it's just so unusual to see block usually block is used for like a shed or something like that you know just and country foundations are always poor poured but um, did it, while we're waiting for Sarah to pull it up, has anybody taken a look at this? Do you have any preliminary thoughts about it? <laughs> anybody? I, you know, I went out and and looked at the property today, and I it's a it's a very uh, sweet area. It has a a perimeter stone wall around it um that is it clearly demarcates the the area that they've kept clear um it's it's a nice location it's a it's a really nice property the house itself um you know it's hard to tell what was built in 1940 but i think it, there's been add-ons to it and i'm not sure exactly when and how but um it's, yeah, it's a kind of a vernacular country home. Um, I can't, I can't really say, say much about the significance of it, except that it's, it's an, you know, it's important that we not lose our sense of these kinds of houses. I'm not sure that this is the one to go to bat for, but it, it seems to me important that this kind of home, um, you know, be be part of our concern uh, but yeah i don't know anything other than what i saw it it does and also like you know could you find someone that was interested in sustaining it i'm not sure that's you know that's sort of another standard by which we think of these things i guess so anyhow yeah, just at this juncture, yeah i think we have to um consider its historical significance yeah. And if people feel strongly enough, like it does meet um, one of the criteria that I read, read then um, you know, we can certainly put it up for a hearing, but I'd like to hear what other folks have to say. It's interesting, the back of it feels a little more, um, you know, vernacular kind of uh, farmhouse-ish, yeah. but the front of it is very much like ranch style. But anyway, other thoughts? Dylan, do you know anything about the history of this area out here? This is the last house in Northampton, correct, Sarah, you said, um, before you cross over into Williamsburg. Yeah, it's really hard to find anything about this area because it's it's off of all of the early maps, even the 1930 maps don't usually go here for Northampton or Williamsburg. Um, for city directories, it's it was, you know, Audubon was once called West Street. Um, and the numbers have been changed over the years as well. So we start to see families listed 
this far, what, what presumably is this far, although the numbers are different on Audubon in the 1940s, so that makes sense. Um, and it's the Tessier family was out here, um, you know, in a few houses and a few properties, I think. Um, but I don't know anything specific to this property um, at all. It's, it's funky. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in that a uh, red building in our back but, yeah, that. yeah that kind of looks um like some kind of a coop actually right yeah and the picture here sarah on the bottom left what is that i don't know okay it, it's hard is it the roof of that red piece or i i couldn't really tell from looking at it yeah, I didn't see it. I didn't see anything like that, but I didn't go back and look at the two red outbuildings. Yeah, it it looks like it's one of those, but I can't tell which one because the, the roof of the house itself looks to be in good shape. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it looks like the back of one of those, and it's you know, the walls are exposed, so the roof is caved in. Yeah. Hmm. Greg or Steve, do you have any um, thoughts about it? Um, I don't have too much more to add. I, I mean, I do think that um, Michael's point about keeping an eye on vernacular architecture and on modest middle income uh, dwellings and maybe Dylan's point too of thinking about the, the way that the community developed over time, spatially outwards from the center and um, history of land development, those are all, I think, useful um, frameworks, maybe, for interpreting what we have here. But based on the evidence that we have, I don't see anything to indicate that it's it's historic, that we can make a finding of um, historic significance. I mean, it does, uh, you know, one of the things that comes to mind in thinking about architectural style is how many kind of category busters there are when you get out and look in the field, right? That you, if you look at Virginia McAllister's book, The Field Guide to American Houses or other style guides, right? There's many, many houses that aren't that aren't named or that show some um, transition or hybrid or connection of styles, things like that. So that's there's some intellectual interest, I think, there. Um, but again, I feel like we're in the kind of the same situation that we often find ourselves in, which is we don't have a lot of um, evidence. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that comes up that kind of draws my attention, Michael also mentioned, and I noticed it in the photographs too, is the, uh, the property itself, some of the landscape features, the stone wall, um, it does seem to suggest that um, there's been a lot of time, um, energy, and and work in molding this landscape around the house, which maybe suggests that people were there earlier. I don't know um, uh, that this was not the first building on the site. Um, so yeah, little little bits of things, some hints of things you might explore more. But at this point, I don't see any evidence for a finding of significance. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I don't have much to add between what everybody's already said. I don't think there's much. I mean, 1940. Um, sad to uh, lose, you know, some of the houses back from that area. But I see she bought in 2019 for 350. Uh, it sounds like it's just not suitable. But I see no historical um, value. You know, unfortunately, it's, you know, out in the boondocks, but I see no historical value. Greg, do you have a sense, um, as I think I saw somewhere, was it 22 acres? Is that right? Yes, sir. And is do you think that is mostly then the value of the land? I, I forget what the breakdown was here that, that attracted a buyer. Yeah, so the building value is two hundred. The uh, land value is two hundred. Also, um, 
out there, I don't see that there's uh, much difference, whether it's one acre or 22 acres. Uh, historically, there's really, as that we're concerned with, there's really nothing that um, makes so much of a difference uh, as opposed to being in downtown Northampton. Uh-huh, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you all articulated um, my thoughts about it as well. Um, it is a beautiful site. So um, if that's the case, um, I would entertain a motion from someone to um, state what we've discussed. Anyone? Uh, I'll give it a try. Um, I move that the commission make a finding that the property under review on Audubon Road in Leeds is not significant under the terms of Northampton's demolition ordinance. Thank you. Second. Any more? Any more discussion? Okay, we will take a vote then. All right. So roll call on that. Uh, Non-significance, Dylan. Yes. Steve. Yes. Michael. Yes. Greg. Yes. And Martha. Yes. All right. You're mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Um, and Martha, I do for the next item. I since Steve is here, I don't know if we wanted to skip. Um, to the, I guess it's essentially a correspondence item discussion. Uh, the correspondence item discussion. Um, um, talking about that mess. Oh, God. Yeah, I saw the 77777 Steve, and I wasn't sure who that was. So, yeah, let's, um, let's talk about that. Steve, are you there? Can you hear us? Can you, can you put your video on? Oh, can there you are. You can see me now. We can see you now. Hello. It's nice Hello. to see you. <laughs> Stay cool and here. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I received a copy of the letter and the new map. Um, and the other commissioners did not. So if you could maybe give us a bit of an overview of what's going on, maybe just a snapshot of what was proposed. And then the response from MHC and what they're what they came back with, and maybe if you could talk about what you see as um, some of the problem with what they're proposing back, and I have some thoughts about it too. But why don't you? And, and Sarah, could you put the map up? Yeah. So I'm gonna. I'll I'll pull, pull, I will first pull up what um, was initially proposed to be included right. in the district. Okay. And everybody knows where this is, right? I know, Dylan. Well, you're about to find out. Okay. Yeah, so this was the original proposed area and it's in, within the purple boundary. And um, is everyone oriented on this, you know, where we are? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Steve, you're squinting at it like you can't see it. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, this was yeah. skewed, skewed somehow. I don't know. This is uh, the one that they sent back in their email. Yeah. Correct. They, yeah, they made a map of your map, and the the aspect looks a little funny. I'm not so sure that this map is the one that you'd want to say was what we proposed to them because I haven't been able to look it over very well. My I have a computer down and. But um, to keep things understandable and short, um, their major objection all along, we thought, uh, that now they have two major objections. One is that if you include areas like the Ross Homestead, which is uh, out to the left here in, with the big fields, including our farmland, in this proposed district, um, you 
end up including a lot of what they consider, and I do too, uh, non-contributing elements of maybe late, mid to late, or like 1870s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, mill housing and some other kinds of housing which don't contribute at all or convey what we're what the general context is that we're trying to have demonstrated with a district in Florence. I don't know how much every all the other members know about our proposal. Should I just briefly say that? That there's the yeah, two prong thing. Does everybody understand the two prong piece? Probably not. So right. Well, the two prongs are one is a proposed Florence district for uh, abolition reform in Florence uh, for a certain period. And um, then a larger context state about reform in and abolition and African American presence in North Hand generally, which isn't proposed a district, but as a uh, multi property listing um, similar say to the statewide one that Catherine and Neil work on on the Underground Railroad where they had our context statement and then they had Hill Ross Farm be uh, a selected um, National Register nomination to illustrate that and that was that was put up by the Mass Historical Committee and it all that went very well but we're kind of up against it at this point because I think um, they don't quite understand uh, what we were driving at. And I don't want to go too deep into um, what we want to do to address it other than to say, talk Catherine Dover and Eel Watson, both of whom um, gave me approval to come up with our a response, which I like to do with historical men. But okay. if you look at what they propose in the letter, now people have a copy of that letter now or not? They don't. Um, I they, have one. It was, okay. it, it, it's yeah. pretty easy. What they, they look, they have it in their brain now, which I'm, I, I hate like that. I won't then. They now seem to think that one of the things missing is the property in Florence don't illustrate the uh, context elements of reform in the larger context. And that was really never our intention. In fact, it's sort of the opposite. Um, Catherine was, up, was often talking about how the documents in some cases about four server um, because she fleshed out a property in Florence in the context. Uh, it had more explanation in terms of the general overview of reform movements in uh, Northampton. So some, at some point I thought they understood that, that it's kind of the reverse of what they are talking about. So by Leaning out everything, reading the context and all the properties mentioned, that uh, they, they winnowed it down to a few very unrelated and some very unimportant uh, properties that might be small, a small district that they could approve. Now, this is, um, I have to tell you, that's pretty outrageous at this stage of the game because it shows that they really don't understand a lot of things. I, I haven't had a bad time working with them. Neil's, Neil has, Neil Larson worked with them mostly. And he put a lot of work into crafting the district boundaries to include these, they, and in a large way, I contribute a lot of as non-contributing properties. Um, so is there any questions at this point before I kind of wrap up what I would propose to you? Because I don't want to take up too much of your time. This just happened in the last uh, two or three days that I was able to 
understand where they were coming from and talk to Neil and Catherine about it. And, and what I'm showing on the screen now is uh, Mass Historic's proposed new boundary in red. Right. Which is just obviously much smaller than, than the original. Um, Steve, do you know off the top of your head um, how many how many individual properties were proposed in the original you know, your our proposal for this district? How many are in that? And then versus how many they're proposing here? It may be as many as 170 or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I have the, I'll see if I can find it, but it, it was a large number. Okay. And then here I, is. What's that? The number that they're proposing looks like, I don't know, 20? Well, these, the, uh, in getting back to them, the, these maps didn't quite make sense to any of us either. They look like they're crop. They don't include everything. If you look at the one that, uh, Sarah had up most recently. That one looks like it's cro a crop portion of another map. So there's some mm -hmm. questions that want to be answered with them with the meeting, which they, the tone of the letter, of course, is cordial and they invited us to continue talking. And uh, I want to do that. Um, and I would propose cutting back some drawing new boundaries um, and coming back with them with the proposal of a district that is coherent from an architectural point of view and also a thematic point of view. So um, just so I understand this, um, is part of their concern that there are were too many non-contributing properties in the larger district yes. or they were there were too many properties that i mean non-contributing because they were outside the period of significance or the period for the district or um, or they were lesser properties both architecturally and historically okay. so much less than the others right. what they ran into and i'll mention it as the I'll say the grossest example of what they backed themselves into was that um, they didn't include Sooner Truth's house because it's not talked about in the context. It was dealt with fully in the district nomination. And so mm -hmm. Catherine did not dwell on it in the context, if you know what I mean. So if their theory was everything the district had to illustrate elements in the context, then you look out not only Sojourner Truth's house, but Park's cemetery, and any number of other properties that are essential to a historic district of this type. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Um, so um, does anybody, do any of the commissioners have any thoughts about this? And I know it's a little bit you don't have a lot of information to go about it, but Dylan, I would be curious what you would have to say about it since you know more about this than the rest of us. Yeah, so that struck me immediately that neither of Sojourner's houses are, are represented, right? The one by Maine's field didn't appear to be in that possibly cropped map either. Right. Yeah, so that it, it seems like a, a oversight misunderstanding or miscommunication on their part. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we wanted to, I my immediate reaction is yeah. If we if we have to draw it smaller, then I guess we need to work on that. But certainly not the way they drew it. Yeah, I I was concerned about the Park Street Cemetery not being in it. Yeah, it seems really critical, and maybe they don't realize. Look at the name on the property. You see there, no, it's all about the small the small district or the small plan you see there it was an Excel document and edf did you do you see that right um if you read down those properties um yeah. the if I can that quickly. Uh, so there's 17 hold, of them hold, hold on one second because it, it might uh be it probably would be worth knowing what they're proposing as a potential small district because they are so 
contig they are contiguous and were mentioned in a context, right? Um, so they want to come back strict and won't. So I not called no on property in small area. And I'll read down the properties. Dylan will, anybody knows Florence a little bit, might recognize them, but um, um, some of them are totally, all right. So we have the William and Randall house down on Montauk, the Ross house, the uh, Amos Ridge house, Dick Parsons house, um, Graves Brothers double house, Ken's house, Florence kindergarten, Hiram Wells, Congregational Church, Pine Grove, Charles Christie House, Congregational Pussinus, A.M. and Wilson, Henry Bond House, and Shackman House. Those are the ones. Now, all of those are, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know too much about Gray Double House, um, but certainly not as contributing as the others. Uh, and if this were, uh, if this were the uh, district, um, it would probably, in, in terms of trying to explain it to people, it would probably convey a message that didn't really start necessarily with the Northampton Association of Education Industry, um, because the congregational church is there. Uh, the Congregational Church Parsonage, A. Lyman Williston House, which has very little architectural integrity, uh, all have to do with the sort of insertion of evangelical uh, Christianity into this hotbed of reform and, um, you know, thinking up and more. And so that's me to where because again, I won't tie up your time too much. Um, where, where I'm going, and I cleared it with, uh, with Catherine and also with Chris Clark, um, who could be a factor in getting through because he's a well-known um, uh, and, and knows this better than anybody. I think the new approach should be to study and have the, the, the properties convey the story of the Northampton Association of Industry, including some preliminaries with Lydia Mariah Child, who was very connected with all of these people. She knew everybody that was there um, mm -hmm. and preceded them by a little bit. Um, but have it be the NAEI in bringing in factors around Brook Farm, because uh, one of the things we didn't uh, do in this reform thing was Brook Farm. Do people know what Brook Farm was? Yes, um, and Hopedale and Fruitlands. People in Massachusetts generally. I want to pitch this to them as a Massachusetts and not just a Northampton project in a sense. Mm -hmm. yes, talking yeah. about, in my view, and I'll make a case for it, but I'm not going to make a big case for it. That this was really the most successful of all four of those projects, if you think about it in this context, which is to follow them through what the Northampton Association to 1844-45, when they decide to go in a different direction a couple of years before they break up entirely. And they call it the neighborhood community. And it really is still there up at the... Uh, up at Park Street, Pine Street, and Maple Street. Um, and it's very interpretable. And, the, and, and then you follow that, the neighborhood community, into the Free Congregational Society, which brings all the elements of reform. And it actually get, it is really good with the context statement of reform in Northampton. So, and we have African-American members of the Free Congregational Society. We have David Ruggles, who died in 1849, who was no doubt considered part of the, the neighborhood community along with Sojourner Truth. These were people that were part of this kind of narrower group of people that we find out about in the Stetson letters of, from letters from an American utopia. So it's an exciting story to have a chance to tell. And I kind of want to make lemonade out of this. And, and be able to tell 
Northampton and Massachusetts what really went on here because it's it, the story has continued to grow since we started this project almost four years ago. Yeah. You know? Well, I think so. What would be useful for us to do? Um, when Sarah and I spoke about this beforehand, it seems like there's some kind of a disconnect or a misunderstanding with Mass Historical. It's I don't know if it's the context or um, you know the um, the architectural narrative. I, I'm not sure what it is. It seems a little unclear to me. And so I think it might be useful if um, we maybe we schedule a meeting with them. I'm, I'm happy to participate in that. I don't know if anybody else on the commission would like to, um, Sarah, and we we'll just schedule a meeting with, a, you know, Ben and his other partners in crime there and see what they hear, fr hear from them. That's I know exactly, they'll do that. That's exactly what uh, Catherine Grover yeah. thought. At, I think after. we should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll we'll go from there. And um, you know, you can make your case. And and maybe they'll say, well, maybe you can alter the context statement a little bit to reflect that, and we can expand the district in size. But I think the fact that you really, you know, the, the thing I love about the boundaries you had on the original one is it really does take in the whole landscape of that community. And that's so important. It's it's not just about houses and you know, the, the clustering congregation. I mean, it really, you know, it's spread out and that's, it wouldn't be the same without the rest of the land, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Definitely right. not without the cemetery. Yeah. Well, part of what made this whole problem happen was stretching it out to include all that farm property and the Ross homestead down that far. Because yeah. then to have it be contiguous, which is what Neil was shooting for, yeah. you know, to include all these properties and do somewhat of a casual historical analysis of these non, what I thought were non-contributing properties. I have this kind of later proposal. I'm fine, it's already on the National Register by itself, Ross Homestead. You would right. move the major discussion of it over to the context, take it out of the district, thereby mm -hmm. pairing off all those properties that were used to try and connect it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I'm going to say this as somewhat of a joke, but not really. Um, then start to move toward its designation as a national historic landmark. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm not kidding, really, uh, because uh, once you know the whole story, it has yeah. so much more integrity than Brook Farm, Hopedale. And only Fruitlands compares, in a sense, to it. And it was such a much minor project. So mm -hmm. uh, that would be my strategy is, in my weighing days, which would be to try and get it landmark status. And then you have, within the district, um, the Florence Kindergarten, which is one of, of the most important uh, uh, in the history of education in the States. You know, it's the first free endowed kindergarten in the country. And uh, that's another building that has quite a bit of integrity um, to be not necessarily a landmark, but it can be a an anchor point in the district mm -hmm. along Samuel Hill's house. So yeah. that, you know, that's what I would kind of suggest. By, and uh, also Charles Burley it gives us an opportunity to talk more about him and introduce him more thoroughly. And he's, his stars on the rise right now. Uh, uh, Dylan just got the portrait of him down at Special Collections, painted by his son. Um, and uh, there's a new blog coming out on the whole Burley family, but featuring Charles more than anybody else. And uh, we know where he was living. We don't know exactly what building he was in 1860 and 1865 before his house was built, which I'd also say, forget, it's not included in the district, okay? That would also help us contract it a little bit, which I think addresses their concern. And that's about it. That's about all I can think of, Mark. Thank you for giving, letting me give such a <laughs> long-winded talk. Now, this is a really important, um, this is very important, and this is an important district to get, um, you know, put on the register and get these properties recognized and also honestly to recognize your work and the work of the Rego Center um, to bring this whole, you know, history of the city to light, um, and also in the context, I love the larger context of the utopian communities. 
-hmm. across the state. Right. Um, so, you know, I th we just need to push on with them. So Sarah, do you want to set something up with MHC? Steve, would you like to weigh in? I see your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a couple of elements. I mean, I think uh, um, one of the things that's so fascinating is that there are so many different kinds of stories. And as you hear it, sometimes you think about the biographies of the individuals. Sometimes you think about the houses and the architecture. Um, but as Martha knows, my background is really cultural landscape thinking. And I think there's two, two distinct landscape stories um, that are part of this. One is the relationship um, the, the topography in the river, so the relationship between the location of farmland and industry and the houses. So if you're talking, talking like a planner, you might be thinking about residential and industrial or residential and agricultural, but that's, that's legible in the topography and in the relationship to the river. And so I think that's one landscape story that to me would argue for a particular type of boundaries and not one that's just on the high ground that's sort of the, the town center or village center story. And then the second is that it seems like there's a link between the community building and the relationship between individuals. So um, between that and reform efforts. So by, by people working together in physical proximity, building a community um, in physical terms, as well as in social, political, economic terms, um, that um, allegiance, alliance, those um, uh, feelings of trust, right, extending out towards making political reform happen elsewhere, so that the physical building of the local community and a kind of community building story, I think, might get you beyond individual owners' houses and, the, and some of the biases that we see in the National Register in terms of being overly architectural focused. Right. Um, yeah. So I don't know, maybe those are, those are two possible openings or ways of bringing some new elements into the story that argue for um, different boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th Steve, I think that's really important to, um, I'm staying Steve Mogo, but also Steve uh, Strymer. I think that it's important um, I guess this is just affirming what you're saying to understand, especially um, this this community, that the land was so important to making it happen. It wasn't just a bunch of people coming together and putting houses together. The land supported their existence, and you can't just ignore that. It becomes an integral part of the whole the whole scene. So the river, the land, the farmland. Um, the I just focus drove all these kind of places right. that were originally included, which yeah. again, if they need to have something compact and be dealt with more at length in the context, there's no reason why they couldn't get their due yeah. in, in there somewhere. So Yeah, I agree. Okay, so does anybody have any, uh, have any other comments, Michael, Greg, about this? This is a very important um, effort that's you know, been in the works as Steve said for a long time, and we've got to make get we've got to get this across the finish line. Yeah, and okay. I guess as as far as like administrative next steps, um, Steve, were were your consultants going to plan to reach out to Mass Historic, or do you think a letter from the commission would be helpful at this point? I'll say anything that keeps them out of it will be the best. <laughs> <laughs> They're both. They both really were upset. I had to let them go on. That, that it, you know. Oh, and okay. It, with Catherine admitting, even though this was a job for hire, you know, she gets attached to her writing. And of course, you know, yeah. Jack's working on a book about this now too. You know that we may publish at levels. We don't, don't know. Um, yeah. So I don't think there's anything. I think we we want to keep Neil. And Catherine away from Ben, <laughs> however we can. So then, you know, then we can, um, you know, sort of run interference, I guess. So um, I think it would be, it would be to our advantage to reach out to MHC and, you know, have a face to face. We can do a virtual meeting with one. I did one on a National Register um, project I worked on last year, the year before, in Eastern Mass, and they'll meet virtually. They just don't like to go to places. So they probably have never been out here. I mean, yeah, if we can get, get to Beverly, they can't get to Beverly, they can't get to Florence. No. They're both good guys. I had 
Zoom meetings with them. It's not like they aren't wanting something good to come out of it. There's several places yeah. that it's a worthy project. It's just that they don't quite understand. Yeah, and I, you know, I've seen instances where the nomination like re really is missing vital pieces of the story, but that that's not the case here. And this is one where it just it doesn't seem like MHC like gets the meat of it. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can convince them of that. But um, Martha, maybe I could just work with you on the the wording okay. of a, of a follow up. Yeah, uh, we can offer to meet with them, and you, yeah, I think and you see. That. I'd, I'd okay. be I'd be interested in participating in the meeting. I'm new to the commission, but I'd like I it's an important project, it, it seems. So yeah, yeah, I'd be interested. Yeah, well, I, I'm flexible. Whatever you set up for timing, I can make if you want me there. Okay. Great. All right. So we'll follow up on that um, you know, after outside of this venue. So but thank you, Steve. Thank for mm -hmm. thank you for your update and We'll, we'll get we'll get this done all right thanks great okay so we have a couple of other items on the agenda um one is uh and i think this is important because michael's been working on this and i would um like to have him have a chance because it's going we only have about 20 minutes left um to talk about the follow-up work he's done since our last meeting on brainstorming about um, possible relationships with some of the um, institutions around. So, um, Michael, do you want to say a few words about this? Yeah, and actually just a few words because I'm going to send out a document um, uh, soon. And the document that I'm sending, last time at our meeting, we were talking about the potential to start tapping some of the talent pools um, related to uh, higher education coursework and students. And um, we were thinking, how can we make use of these resources to move our projects forward? And also how to give, <clears throat> give students the opportunity to do work that gives them experience um, with preservation and with uh, historical interpretation and public history. So uh, we talked about some names, some, some people were recommended uh, that we thought would be good people to either bring together in a, a real meeting or a virtual meeting. Um, and then we also talked about the idea of, and I sent a, a survey around uh, with these questions about potential programs that we might collaborate with um, that offer co coursework or have faculty that are interested in these areas and students that, were, that are working in projects that might be related to areas of interest for us. So that'll, that's the second item in the document that I'm going to circulate. And then the third is to be thinking about potential projects. And this, you know, obviously we have a lot of work with the historic properties inventory and with area forms. Those are, those are projects that sort of are important to the commission, but there are a lot of other ways in which we might be able to imagine um, uh, history and the representation of history in our local context. And so the third part is potential projects. So like I, we have two tracks here. One track is to think about how we might tap into these talent pools and, and provide opportunities for them and resources for us. The other one is to think about what is it that we as a commission want to be doing. And that ties into the fourth area, which is the recommendations from the draft uh, comprehensive plan. and. And there again, you know, we 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 have the planning committee meeting coming up, and hopefully everything will be approved. Um, at that point, uh, Martha and I had a conversation when I first joined the commission, in which she said we need to do something immediately to show that you know we're moving this forward. And so I think we also have have to be thinking about what are our priorities. So we want to reach out but I think we wanna reach out to people in an intelligible way. And we need to think on our side about what are the things that we might wanna be doing and how that might intersect with things that are being done in classroom and um, field work projects. So those are the four areas of the document that I'm gonna circulate. And I invite folks to, if they if they wanna offer you know further input, um, I can include that input and then we can circulate that and maybe have a focused 
kind of conversation about this where we set aside some time at a at a meeting. And I think this is a this is great because I think the timing really works well in the sense that the uh, the comprehensive plan gets approved. And we're starting this at the beginning of summer before the academic year. And we might be able to get some people thinking about how they might in the coming academic year be able to collaborate with us. Um, yeah, so so I think it's a really good time to be starting this conversation and 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 hopefully this document will help move that forward. So if anyone has any input they want to add right now, that's certainly welcome. Otherwise, we can we can do this a little bit more by email if you have oh, anything. We can't do things by email though. I oh, we can't. The, okay. the open the open meeting law fun sponge, but um, oh, I, so I I was just soliciting information. I wasn't really input, but I apparently that doesn't work that way. Yeah, the open meeting yeah. was no fun. Um, so so okay. we can you can send it out, and then everybody can think about it. We can talk about it more at the next meeting. So then that's the way to do it. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's a bit of a. It's no, it's fine. Yeah, I'll I'll figure these things out as I go along. No, All Michael, right. I mean. I think it's yeah i mean i know steve and i've talked about this as the open meeting lot you know it's um i mean i understand the reason for it um it's very important to you know be above board on everything and allow public to be involved as they would like um but it also you know as another layer of trying to get things done i guess what, that's democracy right right <laughs> yeah okay. Okay, so so then I'll send this document. We'll circulate this document. Let me look over it again, Sarah, uh, before we send it out. Uh, I'll send. Uh, I'll send a. I, I saw a couple of typos that I wanted to address, so that uh, I'll send it to you again, and then you'll circulate it. Um, yeah, I can do that. And I had a I had a couple of things to add as well. Just, oh, great! Just small stuff. So, but thank yes. you for doing that. That that's great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, kind of building on that, um, I'm going to talk about the the membership and the um, the membership on the uh, commission last. But um, we are in need of a community preservation plan update. The community preservation plan is uh, different from what's just been um, done and will be reviewed on Thursday. It is the plan that the community preservation committee. Uh, follows uh, in our uh, review of applications. Um, and there's a, a chapter, I guess, on historic preservation and it needs to be updated. Um, so I um, I took a look at that and I uh, had a number of questions about it. I don't wanna go into this tonight, but um, this is something that needs to happen over the summer, right, Sarah? That we should try to get this at least a draft of an update done before the CPC convenes. It does, yeah. So the the community preservation plan is basically the guiding document for the community preservation committee and applicants and other people thinking about how CPA funds can be used in Northampton uh, to figure out what what the city's priorities are, what can and can't be funded, um, what types of projects might be more preferable than others. Uh, and the other eligible funding areas, open space, recreation, and affordable housing, all built on um, really well vetted and um, established long term plans for those areas. And historic preservation was the only one that that didn't have one of those. So this update will need to include um, some thoughts and synopses of what's included in the preservation plan. Yeah, and I think that's what's important is to, you know, go through the plan, the, the preservate our, our new preservation plan and pull out, you know, um, recommendations in that that could possibly be um, eligible for CPA funding. Um, so that I think that needs to be done as part of it. Um, but typically, sir, the, the historical commission members would review any draft updates to the CPS, the, the community preservation plan, correct? Yeah, um, and ideally every board that's a board or commission that has responsibility uh, for one of those items would take the plan, look at it and say, does, does this still meet what we're thinking about now? Are there new uh, opportunities or, or new things that have cropped up that aren't included here? Um, this one's a little bit bigger again because we didn't have a preservation plan before. So there's different um, funding possibilities that were identified that really haven't been addressed in our current mm -hmm. preservation plan at all. Right. Okay. So um, th the other thing too is there's a format to the 
this the community preservation plan and is that going to remain the same uh for the most part yeah okay so I um I would like to be involved in uh, the update. I don't know if any of the other commissioners would like to be involved in that. Um, I'm happy to you know su submit suggestions to you, Sarah. Um, you'll you'll be compiling the updated plan, I gather, since you're in charge of that committee. Um, if anybody else would like to review um, the chapter on historic preservation and juxtapose it against our new historic preservation plan. Um, and submit comments to Sarah, that would be great. And I can send out a word version of the um, of what we have in the existing community preservation plan for yeah. everybody to look at it. That would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, great. That would be fabulous. So for probably I guess for the next meeting, we should try to get that together. If, if anyone has time to do it, um, that would be great. Okay. Uh, and then the final thing was um, just membership. So Steve is going off and uh, Barbara, we still don't know, correct, Sarah? Yeah, I, I haven't. Um, so she, Barbara had mentioned that she's been on the, the uh, Historic Commission for like an extraordinary number of, was it 20 years or, or better? Um, so she was thinking that she'd you know, maybe like to uh, think about doing some other stuff, but would talk to people at Historic Northampton to figure out someone who would be a good fit. Um, but yeah. she did indicate she would be willing to stay on the commission until that point. So maybe just a couple months. Okay. Well, it could be longer because the person has to go through city council vetting, That's right? That's true. And, and we have to convince someone that, it, that it's a good idea or Barbara does. Exactly. Yeah, so, um, so but that doesn't mean that we will have a full slate of, um, you know, because we need to replace Steve and then we still have one vacancy. So um, uh, please keep your mind open and eyes open and ears open and thoughts open um, for additional members who would be um, good to join us. And, and Steve Slot is the AI, Western Mass AIA um, uh, designee. And I did reach out to them and they had not identified anyone uh, who would be interested and willing to be on the commission who doesn't have conflicts. There's a lot of architects who practice locally and they found out unfortunately really quickly that it, you know the participation in the historic commission would really preclude them from some, some jobs that they'd be able to take. So I haven't heard back from them, but there is a method to fill that slot if they're not able to come up with anyone, but we still would need someone who was interested and willing to do it. Yeah, okay. Great. I know I sound like a broken record, but we need to get a full slate of commissioners. So, yeah. After okay. after twelve years on the board, I had announced a couple of years ago that I was going to step aside as soon as we got the Florence Historic District approved. But I guess that's uh, going to be a long ways away. So I'm here for a while. I mean, well, even if it was, yeah. I mean, yeah. Mass Historic wants to take their time with everything, exactly. so could be another, yeah, you could be like a grandfather by then, Dylan. I could retire and leave the commission at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, is there any other any items that people wanted to bring up that we hadn't discussed? Because we do have a few minutes left. Okay, if not, um, we have another meeting scheduled for July, uh, it would be the 30th, am I right? Uh, 29th. 29th. Okay. And hope to see everyone on Thursday as well. In, in person Thursday, yeah. um, at seven in council chambers if you can, and there's a Zoom option as well if you can't make it in person. Right. And that's on the agenda, which you can get off the planning board website. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right. Everyone have a great 4th of July.